Once everyone is seated, we are going to introduce and invite Crystal Moody Wood up to the stage. Um, Crystal is an expert on the textile industry and making some of the connections between textiles and sustainability and the impacts on the marine environment. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Carolyn. Thanks, Meg, for inviting me. Um, it's been really amazing to be a part of this community. I thought I would be a marine biologist by this age, um, very, a very successful one, or maybe um, working with dolphins or whales, but instead I ended up in the textile industry, and now I get to work with all the wonderful people um, that work in the marine environment. Um, so I'll be talking to you today about what design change looks like for the textile industry. We heard a lot about how the results are showing a lot of fibrous, uh, the fibrous category of microplastics. Um, we in the textile industry use a different definition for microfiber. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, let's see, how do I advance? It's thinking, I have the wheel. Shirt. Um, so just a little bit about my organization. Um, so I, I have a sustainable textile consultancy here in the Bay Area. Um, I have over a decade working primarily with the outdoor industry and um, more local materials innovators. So my job is typically a materials developer um, and I work with the value chain all the way back to farmer or feedstock um, and working through specking, yarn development, textile development, um, and what product looks like for sustainability. And we've got a couple pictures. Um, also with my consultancy in the year 2020, I've done a little bit of this so far, but I feel like with sustainable textile education, it's really important to have um, an experiential learning platform. I think part of that was inspired by um, my opportunity to join Marcus uh, and the Five Gyres crew on their Indonesia sale last year. Um, it was an incredibly impactful experience and I really want to bring that um, to textile professionals as well. I hope this isn't my fault. <laughs> we did have a lot of back and forth with the presentation. It's okay. Um, I'll just keep rolling with it. Um, so while they're doing that, um, I, I first wanted to talk about what design change looks like for my career and, and my consultancy. Um, so that's included trips to the Univers University of Toronto with Chelsea Rockman, Lisa Ertl, and Alice um, talking through uh, dye classes and what they were seeing on the ramen. Um, it's included bringing 20 different textile professionals from Patagonia, Toad & Co, um, and many other brands out with Captain Charles Moore in Long Beach, um, educating them on plastic <coughs> pollution. Um, it's, uh, it's also included, um, try now. Yay! <laughs> Um, sorry, I said I would stay behind the podium. Um, uh, Captain Charles Moore um, on a sale that we, uh, through my role in AATCC as sustainability co-chair, I'll talk a little bit more, more about that organization later, um, but we, we learned a lot about what the microplastics we were seeing out in LA. Um, there were not only professionals from the LA area, but also from the Bay Area that came down. Um, these are just an example of, of organizations I've worked with. Uh, Fiber Shed is here in the audience, Bolt Threads, Mango Materials. I think Anne was here earlier. Jamie from Bolt Threads is here as well. So um, a really diverse group of both brands and people on the research side that are really pushing um, and innovating in the areas of soil, sea, and circularity. Um, 
So I spoke a little bit about this. Um, I've been an active member of the Microplastics Policy Committee since 2018. Um, and one thing I really wanted to highlight was a conference that me and a couple uh, other textile professionals, part of the AATCC California, it's a trade organization that's national, but we have a California chapter. We're hosting a sustainable textiles conference next week, October 8 through 10, called Re Resilient Textile Systems Through the Lens of Soil and Sea. Um, we have an entire day dedicated to sea, um, and also Lisa, Carolyn, and Becky talking about the awesome research that they've been working on the last three years in front of an audience of textile professionals who are hopefully um, challenged and ready to, to work on soil and sea after that conference. Um, so what, is the de what has design change looked like for the textile industry so far? Well, first and foremost, we have to measure too. Uh, we're developing fiber release test methods. Um, there's been a couple different individual groups globally around the world that we're working together. Thankfully, a lot of that momentum's coming together now. We've got US and the Europe group, uh, the Microfibers Consortium working together to develop a globally recognized fiber release test method. Um, major hurdles have included what testing equipment to use, whether we mock with an accelerated test in these small metal canisters or we're testing full product every time, which uses a lot of chemicals and energy to get there. Um, but the accelerated test is something we've used in testing previously for color fastness. So this is a method we'll, we'll likely move forward with. Um, we've uh, filtration method and media has been a lot of hurdles to go through. We've got uh, sample pre preparation as well. If you're not sealing the edges, there's uh, opportunity for a lot of that fiber effluent to come off that doesn't necessarily mimic what's happening in the garment because a lot of times in the garment, you've got some sort of um, sewed edge or binding that's, that's really, or at least a quality garment, um, that's preventing that sort of fiber eff effluent from coming through. Um, so uh, additionally, we're seeing increased commitments to recycled content. Um, this is great, um, but I feel like it is skipping, you know, we've heard this theme a lot, it's skipping the um, reuse and reduce models and going straight to, hey, we're going to, by 2024, have 100% recycled plastic. And I, I do think this is a, a great first step, and so we're seeing Everlane and Adidas and Patagonia continue their commitments to um, using recycled content. Actually, uh, Steph, you're in the room. Um, Why Recycled is a fantastic video about recycling and really how um, Patagonia is, in, it, is incorporating it into their product and just really educating on how that works within the textile supply chain. So I highly recommend it. Um, we in the textile industry are starting to educate on new methods for consumer care. Uh, part of the fast fashion movement is we've all forgotten how to take care of our clothes. Um, but we also uh, have um, different campaigns like Levi's in 2014 telling you don't, wa don't wash your jeans. Um, it will uh, prevent from fading and it also significantly reduces the impact of the life cycle of your clothing. 60% of the environmental impact of apparel is uh, the materials process and developing those materials, but 20% is that consumer care phase. So washing your t-shirt, washing your pair of jeans. Um, a lot of times I just hang up and air dry. Um, we also see companies like the Girlfriend Collective who sell synthetic performance wear, designing their own sexy uh, filter that you can buy um, for your washing machine um, and companies like Patagonia. Um, in the meantime, uh, educating on washing bags so you can put your synthetics in, um, in this sort of filtration unit within your washer. Um, and then I just wanted to mention the icebreaker campaign as well. So they've been um, Icebreaker is a company out of New Zealand. They uh, have mostly, they're 84% natural fibers, mostly merino wool. Um, and they had a campaign recently, seven days, one tea, zero washes. And the Instagram's beautiful with all these people doing outdoor activities, wearing their wool over and over and over again. Um, I did do this on the John Muir Trail last year with my wool items. And 
after a while, I'd say about seven days, it's time to dunk it in the Alpine Lake. <laughs> Uh, we're seeing marketing of ocean plastic cleanups. Um, uh, you've got companies like United by Blue out on the East Coast who for every uh, article of clothing they sell, they also pick up a pound of trash. Um, Everlane partnering with organizations like Surf Rider during Black Friday to do ocean cleanup. And then the Vortex Swim, um, which Ben Lecomte, uh, you see Icebreaker really being the main sponsor of that and encouraging everyone to hashtag move to natural. Um, so this, all of these things being really great for today, um, but what should design change look like for the textile industry? Um, because it's not just about recycling um, and education, it's about uh, action. So one of those things is um, building in circularity and reuse or re-commerce. Um, extend the life of your garments after the first use. Um, you've got companies like Renewal Workshop um, who are working with brands to repair uh, different, mostly outdoor garments, but I think I'm seeing, we also have Koyuchi, their local company working with them in the bedding industry. Um, they're uh, using a waterless technology for washing uh, the apparel, mending it where it needs it, and then reselling it again to consumers. Um, you've got Patagonia's Warnwear program really encouraging you to live the story of your garment and just keep patching that and, and sewing up your garment um, for all the adventures it's been on. Um, we uh, are seeing rental models now with Rent the Runway um, being really successful in the fashion side of the industry. Um, these, are, these are very important models for the future of apparel because um, it really extends the resources that go into those items. Uh, and then also um, sort of fancier versions of, of thrift stores but online commerce like Real Real where you can get uh, luxury items um, from a lot of the high-end designers that have been pre-worn or sometimes in people's closets and never worn, and they get to be resold rather than given to a thrift store and potentially shipped overseas. Um, so it also should look like reinvesting in natural material systems, um, designing with soil and sea and healthy living, living systems in mind, moving from a supply chain to a value chain, knowing your producers and makers, and recommitting to renewable and regenerative cotton, wool, linen, hemp, and leather. Um, this, I have a picture of the Climate Beneficial Wool or Cali Wool program that the North Face uh, first launched in, I think it was 2014. We've got Jess Daniels in the room uh, representing Fiber Shed, who was the nonprofit and soil advocate uh, and, and research body really um, uh, working on this program. I was actually working with them at the time as materials manager for this program. Um, and what's great about it is not only is it made of natural materials, but it's supporting a rancher who's looking at soil health and drawing carbon into their soils um, as a solution for climate change. So really building a, a material supply chain that not only reduces the amount of, say, plastics in our environment, but also is mitigating climate change and, and creating a solution for us uh, and supporting regenerative agriculture. And ideally, we'll see that in cotton and wool and these other natural fiber systems as well. Um, and if you want to know more about that, Jess is here in the audience, and I'd be happy to talk about it as well. Our grazers play a very important role in uh, how we manage carbon in the atmosphere. Um, the other thing that needs to happen is we need to develop new material alternatives. We are seeing new cellulosics from textile waste, like, com like the Seattle company Evernew. Um, there's a picture here of the Stella McCartney product that uh, they made uh, using inputs from the textile sector, cellulosics turning into um, uh, 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 their, their new man-made version uh, of a cellulosic. We've got other cellulosics from the food waste industry like hemp, banana leaf. Uh, there's a company down in LA called Circular Systems that is doing a lot of that work. Um, we've got more plant-based feedstocks for leather alternatives like Pinatex or natural fiber welding. Um, so if you're someone who doesn't want animal byproducts, um, this is where you can go rather than the vegan leathers, which are essentially polyurethane and a lot of the petroleum-based alternatives. 
Um, we've got milk fiber, um, like the company Q Milk, which is also from a food industry waste. They're taking uh, spent milk from the grocery stores and um, basically dehydrating it and spinning it into a casein fiber. Uh, they're based out of Germany. It's a pretty exciting model to watch as well. Um, you've got bioengineered fibers like Bolt Threads um, who are uh, uh, feeding a renewable feedstock to a, an engineered organism to create um, uh, silk and, and different materials that, that should have the ability similar to what spider silk would have to biodegrade in the atmosphere or in the environment. You've got bioengineered dyes and chemistry, a similar uh, biotech platform from Colorifix, um, and many more. <laughs> so um, one I wanted to highlight was a company actually locally, um, Mango Materials, I think Anne left. Yeah, she's not here anymore. Um, so they're using a naturally occurring bacteria um, they're setting up their, their pilot facility and eventually their launch facility um, at wastewater treatment plants. They're feeding that bacteria methane. Um, it naturally digests that methane and creates a naturally occurring biopolymer called PHA. Um, and they're looking to use PHA to create different bioplastics as well as um, textiles that uh, should be able to degrade in the same loop that they were created from. Um, so it's this sort of holistic thinking that we really need to incorporate moving forward for all these new material alternatives. Um, so that's why more research in the fiber side and understanding and classifying what is out there today and what's still existing and causing issues um, is gonna help inform what, what we do in the mater new material space. Um, so important takeaways are look at your own closet and wear with your values in mind. Question what, how, who made your clothing and footwear? Our clothing is a creative expression of who we are and what we believe in. New and better materials need your voice and dollar. Um, apparel and footwear is just part of the picture. Textiles are all around us and they're all used with the same materials. Um, and we need more ocean and science experts at the table to build better solutions and faster. So join me, Materia Evolve, in building an ocean-healthy materials world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Crystal. Um, next up, we have Lisa Ertl, who's a PhD candidate in Chelsea Rockman's lab, and she's going to talk about the efficacy of filtration um, solutions and a pilot study underway. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Um, thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to share some of our work in the Rockman Lab looking at a microfiber solution. A lot of my work in my PhD is looking at contamination of microplastics in the environment and also what the effects are when they're ingested by aquatic organisms. But because I also care a lot about solutions, I've been really excited to also do this as part of my PhD. And um, I'll tell you about some of our results and how it might be applied in the San Francisco Bay Area. In San Francisco Bay, as we heard about this morning, um, we see a lot of microfibers and a lot of tire dust. Um, often microfibers are the most common particle type that we're finding in these samples. Uh, we'll certainly need solutions for both, um, for all different ki kinds of plastic that are getting into the environment. And I'll talk about a solution that we know about for microfibers. As many of you are very well aware, it seems like microfibers are becoming the new microbeads. Microfibers are being given increasing attention in the media, by the scientific community, and there's legislation on the table in California and in other jurisdictions around the world addressing this source of microplastics. Overall, textiles are proposed to be a very small source of microplastics by weight. This is an estimate from Unomia, and they estimate that 190,000 tons are released per year. But this is in weight, and a single ton of microfibers likely has quadri quadrillions of microfibers. That's in the thousands of trillions. So it seems that by number, microfibers are really quite ubiquitous around the globe. 
As our technologies have been going down to smaller and smaller size fractions, as we talked a bit about this morning, we're taking bulk water samples, we're really finding microfibers as the most common type of plastic pollution in our samples. Microfibers are in sediment, they're in surface water, in freshwater and marine environments, they're in Arctic sea ice, um, in soil. Almost everywhere scientists are looking, we're finding these fibers and we definitely need solutions. Diverse wildlife are also contaminated. They're ingested by wildlife in places as remote as the deep sea. They're found in seafood. And they're transferring between trophic levels in the food web, like we heard about this morning, from prey uh, to predators. And in the fish that I'm sampling from the Great Lakes, I'm finding over 95% of the anthropogenic particles are microfibers. Um, and some of these contain natural fibers too, like cotton and wool, but also have synthetic chemicals and dyes. So connecting microfibers to a source, how did this all begin? The first study to report fibers and link them to a source in terms of marine debris was by Mark Brown in 2011. He also did the first study with a washing machine and connected washing machines to a source of microfibers. Because the proportions of synthetic fibers he was finding in sewage sludge and on beaches resembled those of the clothing that we wear, um, he, he, him and his group counted the number of fibers discharged into wastewater from normal laundering of clothing. Since then, studies show that a single load of laundry can release upwards of hundreds of thousands of microfibers in a single wash. And with, while there are definitely other sources of microfibers as well, like Jared mentioned, like uh, dryers, also carpets, cigarette butts, fishing nets, there, there are plenty more. But what we do know is that when washing machine effluent is carried to wastewater treatment plants, some microfibers are released directly into aquatic environments. Some are also captured in the sludge and then released on land like Becky talked about. Uh, a single plant has been shown to release upwards of 4 million microfibers, or microplastics, sorry, in a single day. Most of those are microfibers. And for San Francisco Bay, uh, it, for wastewater treatment plants in this area, we've known for several years that microfibers are the most common type of microplastic particle. So we looked at this and recognized that reducing microfibers uh, at this emission source could really be an effective solution to addressing a major contributor of microfiber pollution. So as a pilot, we investigated the effectiveness of two technologies, both marketed to reduce microfiber emissions in our lab. This work was largely done by two undergraduates in our lab, and they did loads of laundry without de either devices, and then loads of laundry with either a device that goes in the washing machine or is a filter uh, on the external effluent pipe of the washing machine. We quantified the efficacy for mitigating fibers from the wash, and here are the results from our study that we published earlier this year. This is a box plot of results showing the mean fibers per liter of washing machine effluent. Without either device, we found an average of 5,000 microfibers per liter. Uh, in a single load of laundry. And both devices reduce the number of microfibers in, liter, uh, in the effluent by an average of 26% for the in-device or 87% for the filter. And this demonstrated that filters, when we add them to washing machines, they significantly reduce microfibers that are shed from garments. And this means that filters added to washing machines work um, and reduce the number of microfibers that are going into the wastewater streams. We followed this up with research with an additional filter. This was done by Sam Athey, another PhD student in our lab, and she found that the filter all led to an 89% fiber reduction by weight. So these other filters also work. Using the results from our study, we asked ourselves what the reduction would look like in microfibers when we thought of a municipal scale, and we performed a back of the envelope calculation for the city where we live. Using the average number of microfibers shed in a load of laundry and the number of average wash loads per year that people do in their homes, we calculate that the release of microfibers could be in the order of trillions of microfibers per year. And this is just for a single city. If on a municipal scale, either device were placed into all households in Toronto, then the number of microfibers emitted into wastewater from washing machines could be reduced by 6 to 9 trillion for the in-wash device or 20 to 31 trillion for the effluent filter each year. And since the whole Bay Area has around twice the number of households as the city of Toronto, this would translate to an even larger microfiber release and potential reduction for microfibers in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
Next, as a proof of concept, we scaled up our lab study and brought this to a community. I would have loved to do this in the city of Toronto, but we have lots of people. And unfortunately, a town of 6,500 was much more manageable for this first community study. And here I'm really fortunate to partner with a local environmental charity, Georgian Bay Forever. Um, they're interested in reducing microfibers from going into the Great Lakes. And we designed and recently started running the study with 100 filters in people's homes. Um, and since we know that these filters are effective when we have them in the lab, we were super curious about what it was like when we actually had them in people's homes and didn't just have trained people in the lab that were using them and emptying them out. The only requirements we had for people to participate in this study was that they needed to be connected to town water. It's a very rural area, so uh, you couldn't participate if you had, uh, had a septic tank. Um, we wanted to monitor the effluent uh, at the wastewater treatment plant, so you needed to be connected to the town water. You needed to have the space to install a filter. Your effluent pipe for your washing machine couldn't be buried behind a wall. Um, and you, they also needed to agree to keep the filter running for two years, which is the duration of the study, and save captured laundry lint during this time. They're, they're saving their laundry lint and putting it in their freezer, and I'm going and collecting it a few times a year. <laughs> So we installed 100 filters in people's homes, and this is in a community with just over 1,000 homes connected to the wastewater treatment plant. So we would expect to see an approximate 10% decrease in microfibers at the wastewater treatment plant. And here is what we found so far. So this is a sneak peek into our first results. So I'd ask that you please not share these initial findings. We still need to sample an additional time period as well as quantify some of the smallest particles in our samples, which are, are hard to quantify. But what we found so far is that we might be seeing a decrease in the amount of microfibers. This plot shows the average number of fibers per liter for composite samples at three different sample periods. Two sample periods uh, before installing the 100 filters and then one sample period immediately after. Um, the second time period, which was taken in July, might have a fewer fibers than we would have originally expected. Um, we had a go date the summer of August 1st and we had them installed in people's homes, but some people felt bad that they were still polluting the lake. So they actually switched it on a little bit early so um, that's science, so some of them turned it on early, that's fine. Um, what we're doing next is we're going to quantify the less than 250 micron size fraction, but what we see for this large size fraction is that there is a decrease over time in fiber count for final effluent, so it does seem like this also works when we have them in a community, these filters. So throughout our two-year study, uh, we'll also monitor the lint that's captured in these filter bags. Here's a small piece of laundry lint that I uh, brought into the lab for my own laundry filter in my home, so I'm literally airing my dirty laundry for you all to see. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of these fibers all tangled up. And we'll be taking samples from all 100 volunteers in our lab, and we'll be looking at the composition of what is captured in these bags so we can know the material type and the average number of microfibers that are captured um, throughout the study. We'll also test for several contaminants to see if we're also capturing contaminants like flame retardants and perfluorinated chemicals because we know that washing clothing is a way that chemicals can transfer from indoor environments into water through uh, laundry. So the reactions from the community, they've been incredibly positive so far. Generally, everyone has been surprised at the amount of lint that they're collecting. Microfiber pollution was a new issue for most of the people in our study. Most of them had never heard of microfibers before. Uh, volunteers have been eager and enthusiastic to participate. Eight weeks into the study, things are still going really well. We're still getting positive feedback. And uh, the response that we've gotten is that it's become a normal habit. People are cleaning out these filters every two two to four weeks, um, and, and it's just a regular thing and that people have not had any problems with. Really, the only main challenge we faced in the study is that people really wanted a filter, but then they couldn't get one. So, so there was an overwhelming experience. We had to turn down volunteers due, due to space limitations or accessibility issues. In a couple of cases, there were older folks who couldn't reach over their washing machine or, or open up the filter trap. But I know Santa Cruz is also interested in a similar pilot program, and I'd be happy to share some more of the details, but uh, the bottom line was that it has worked really incredibly well.
and we've been so happy to have Brian and Wexco, uh, he's here today, who, is the, who works for uh, the company designing the filtrol and has been really helpful in this process. So some of the next steps in addressing microfibers will be to identify and quantify other sources. Since we're, there are likely other sources of microfibers, um, like rope and fishing lines, cigarette butts, wet wipes. Since we're seeing so many microfibers in things like the urban sto stormwater, we really need to quantify what these different sources are. Um, they're also floating around in the air, um, so we can look to the relative contributions of each. So just to sum up, um, there's widespread microfiber contamination in habitats and wildlife. We see contamination here in the San Francisco Bay Area, also around the globe. But we can do something about it, because we know that these m proposed mitigation strategies work. Uh, a next step will be to have filters put into homes to reduce microfibers from washing machines. But a more practical next step might be just to have these filters installed directly into washing machines, like they have in other countries. Um, what we now have is solutions for domestic washing machines. There's also a need to investigate other microfiber sources and develop solutions like for commercial and industrial laundry. We see that as also as important. And also we need to better understand the relative contributions of other microfiber sources, which could be contributing to airborne and other urban sources. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Chelsea Rackman, the rest of our lab, and many people who've helped me in this work. Thank you. so much, Lisa. In an effort uh, to keep things moving, we're going to have um, a time at the end of this session for a couple of combined questions, and we'll also have the, uh, the social at the end. And for those of you on live stream, you can download the 400-page report, and I'm sure all your questions will be answered there. Um, next up, we will have Nick Lapis, who is the Director of Advocacy for Cal Californians Against Waste. He's going to share his perspective as a policy expert on the key focuses and the, the way forward. Thank you so much for putting this together. Um, I was told to keep this short, so I'm gonna have to keep my puns to a minimum. <laughs> Couldn't help it in the title, but I'm gonna try to keep it down after that. So California's Against Waste, we're an environmental organization based in Sacramento. We do recycling policy, uh, advocacy, coalition building, that kind of stuff. Um, like many of you know us. Uh, I'm going to focus specifically on the legislative framework that we've had over the last few years on microplastics legislation and where I think we're going in the near term. So we've heard about this bill all day, right, AB 888 by Richard Bloom, which was California's uh, microbeads ban. Um, so I'm not going to go into the specifics. I think you've all heard about it all day. I will say that it was an amazing effort from the folks in this room, um, you know, Chelsea testifying in committee, Stiv really getting all of us excited about this. Um, and so it was a two-year effort, but the bill passed, prohibiting uh, uh, microbeads in personal care products. And within a few months of the bill passing, the industry actually went to Congress and said they wanted a, a national standard because they didn't want to deal with every state coming up with their own legislation. And so it was actually enacted federally the same year. So that's a total success story. And Stiv and the Five Gyres folks definitely deserve all the credit for that. Yeah. Another bill that uh, I thought kind of fits into this category and that we've spent, been spending a little bit more time on recently is a, a series of bills that have been enacted to limit greenwashing for plastic products. So we actually prohibited the use of the term biodegradable in California. You are not legally allowed to put the word biodegradable, photodegradable, oxodegradable on any product that's sold in the state. And the reason for that is that it was used to greenwash all sorts of stuff, right? Because biodegradable is, doesn't say anything about the time that it'll take to biodegrade. It just says that it physically can. And even biodegrade's not a scientific term. So we had all sorts of plastic products that were labeled biodegradable. Um, and the legislature passed a series of bills 
first banning the use of biodegradable in cutlery and then plastic bags, and then eventually in all plastic products. Um, we're looking at expanding that further and building on some of the work that Miriam and others have done in terms of saying, okay, so we're not gonna have biodegradable plastics, but what about the stuff that's compostable? Is there an opportunity to hone that in a little bit more and say compostable means BPI certified, compostable means PFAS free? Um, so I think that's gonna be coming up in the next, uh, next couple of years. Uh, two bills you heard about recently, these are from last year. Uh, the first is SB 1422, which requires all drinking water to be tested for microplastics. I believe we have the person in charge of implementing the bill here. Um, so the, the thinking here, and this was an idea that came from Senator Portentino. Um, I think he approached the environmental community and suggested to us, usually ideas work the other way around. Um, but it's actually a kind of a brilliant idea. So the water board will test uh, all drinking water to determine whether or not there are microplastics and how many microplastics are in the drinking water. And they will have to report that information to their customers. Um, so everybody's going to get, or hear on the local news, that their drinking water has plastic in it. And I can't think of any better uh, advocacy than that. In a similar vein, the same year, Senator Portentino uh, authored a bill. Uh, this was originally, I think, some people in the wastewater industry were really hoping this would be an alternative to the previous bill. But it directs the Ocean Protection Council to develop a microplastic strategy. And you heard about that in Mark's presentation. Um, I think this, is, this strategy is where we're going to figure out what we're doing moving forward. So those are the bills that passed. Um, I'm going to go to the bills that are not yet successful. Uh, a couple years ago, we co-sponsored legislation with Story of Stuff Project requiring warning labels on synthetic clothing. Uh, basically, warning labels are saying, you know, warning, this is made of plastic, and you know, provide care instructions for how to minimize microfiber pollution. Um, the bill made it out of its policy committees and its fiscal committees. It did not have the votes on the assembly floor. I think our real goal with the bill was to get the conversation started in the California legislature. And in that sense, the bill accomplished its goal. I think most of the, the assembly members, or at least back then, probably uh, learned what microfibers were for the first time and learned that it's a serious issue. A bill we introduced this year, uh, also with, a, with Assembly Member Bloom, is a little more nitty gritty. So this goes beyond the warning labels, and it does a few different things. It requires uh, filtration devices for all commercial and industrial laundry facilities. It requires the water board to test clothing to come up with both methodologies for, for quantifying microfiber pollution, but also best practices. And so the, the thinking there is, you know, you look at a brand, you look like a, at a brand like Gap, right? They have four different product lines that they own. They own Gap, Banana Republic, uh, Old Navy, and Athleta at four different price points. All four sell fleece sweaters. The Athleta sweater is designed to last a hell of a lot longer than the Old Navy one, right? And we know that in, in, intrinsically because it's more expensive, it's a more premium product, but there are functional differences in terms of the weave tightness and other design changes that a single company chooses to make between product lines. And I think ultimately uh, we are going to have to look at product redesign and the first step is analyzing what those differences are. For some reason, I switched from not yet successful to in progress. <laughs> like I didn't want to say it wasn't successful. Um, so you've heard about this bill all day, SB 54 and uh, AB 1080, two companion bills. We have two of the author's offices here who pour their heart and souls into the, into the bill. Um, so th the bill is not dead, just to be totally clear. It wasn't taken up before the legislature adjourned for their three-month 
recess, but it's eligible to be taken up in January. And frankly, there were so many things that led into the bill not being taken up, most of which really had nothing to do with the bill itself. I still think it's on the verge of passing. Um, so it's just delayed by a few months. And I'm not going into details because I think folks have talked about all of these in the past uh, or today, so I was told to go fast, so I'm just skipping through them. So this is where I think we're going in the next few years, or at least where I think the focus is. Um, the first is the, the statewide microplastic strategy. So we passed this bill telling the Ocean Protection Council to develop a strategy for the state. Um, that means all of us did a small part of our job, because now we have to go participate and go schedule meetings with Mark and tell him and Holly and tell him, hey, this is what needs to be in the strategy. Because the report they put out will be the blueprint that the legislature is going to run with. And I really encourage everybody who's in this room to be very active in that process. I touched on this earlier, product redesign and sheddability standards. Um, ultimately, we as an organization believe in producer responsibility. And the manufacturers of these, clothings, of these uh, clothing items should not be allowed to make products that shed excess amounts of microfibers. Let me repeat that. Here. <laughs> clothing manufacturers should not be allowed to shed microfibers. Now, I said excess the first time because we're not going to get rid of everything. But we can definitely change some of the, the most you know, cheaply made fall apart clothing. And uh, the way we do that, I think, is the same way we do it with air quality and water and other things we want to regulate, which is we have the best available control technology. We have a regulatory agency that says that for Reducing this type of pollution, you need to do X. And that's where we're going to head on clothing. I think it's unavoidable. It's just a matter of time. And then the last thing I want to mention is filtration. Now, usually a lot of us in the environmental community get uncomfortable when we start talking about downstream solutions, right? You don't want to clean up the mess downstream. Well, this is too big of a problem to not look at filtration. And I like the chart earlier, I forgot who had it, where it was the three-dimensional problem, right? Started with the clothing, went to the, the washing machine, went to the wastewater treatment. I think we really have to intervene at all of those places. Um, if, if I had to guess, I would say that in 10 years, you would not be allowed to sell a washing machine in California that does not have a microfiber filter. You know, I think we're maybe a little far from that at this point. Um, actually, I don't know if, let's say, I think I have a little bit of time. This was an article that the, one of the industry trade associations posted after the, the bill didn't get taken up this year. Um, well, there are several really funny things about the article, but one of them is that they're saying it's going to cost $200,000 per washing machine. <laughs> so it's a really good, you know, it's a really good business. If somebody can make one for $100,000, you're going to sell them like hotcakes. <laughs> no, but all, all joking aside, I think it'll take one major OEM to put it into one of their commercial, or not commercial, one of their you know, mainstream lines. And as soon as it's possible, as soon as it's on the market and we see that it's possible, the mandate will be down the line right after that. Here's my contact information, and try to keep it short. Thank you so much, Nick. Um, now we have our, our final speaker before, um, before Mark Gold wraps us up and gives us the way forward. Uh, what's his name? Oh, Marcus Erickson, my husband. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the momentum that is, is in this space is just amazing, isn't it? That we've come this far. Uh, to the point that I feel more optimistic today than ever before. There's still a long road ahead, but, and I want to talk about a little bit about the people that have made this happen. I've got a few minutes to speak, not, not very long, but then also how we got here to this, this point. How many of you have sailed with, with five gyres on a voyage? 
quite a few people in this room. Um, all of you were on the boat when we, were, when we went to each of these dots on this map. That's where we've been to drag our, our manta trawl behind the ship and pull out plastics, dig through um, a little jar full of, of zooplankton and microplastics, and try to quantify. Because back then, the big question was, well, how much is out there? All this talk of these mythical islands of trash, but not much data on, well, what is it like globally? And we set sail and began to find it was mostly just small fragments of plastic, microplastics. These fictitious islands were just a sensationalized mythology. And we published the paper and got this big number, 5.25 trillion little bits and pieces of plastic in the world's oceans. That's, and this is going five years back, probably a lot more today. But we put those 5.25 trillion particles of plastic on the map, and here's what it looks like. It is, it's not islands, more like a smog of small bits and pieces. It is the ultimate tragedy of the commons. You really can't point to a, a country or a company as the culprit. In fact, Anne and I remember we took a jar of ocean plastics to the, uh, the CEO of Procter & Gamble almost, almost 10 years ago. And he looked at it and said, well, how do you know it's mine? And we're like, oh, gee, what are we going to do? And of course, we then turned our tails, went upstream. Didn't turn our tails, went upstream. And, uh, and we found Michael Beach, you know the story of what happened there. And working upstream is really where all the work is today. And that's why I want to acknowledge that where we are today, working in the Bay, uh, and Carolyn, the work that you have done to bring us to this point, work with an amazing team at SFEI is just, it's inspiring because we have come this far. But it gets complicated when you go upstream. It's not a, it's not a handful of little small sort of uniform uh, microplastic fragments primarily. It gets really complicated quickly. And as you begin to look at what is in our coastal environments, in our bays, in our rivers, on our streets, um, on our roadsides, it gets really complicated. Are we talking about um, circuit filters, or textiles, or, um, or fishing gear, or e-waste, or single-use plastics? What is the specific thing you're, work, you're working on? And uh, Chelsea, you showed a, a slide earlier ago about the different kind of polymers how it gets complicated. Well, each of these has a different dominant polym polymer, has a different input into the environment, different impact on, on the environment, um, in our, on our communities, and a very different strategy and a different policy that can be applied to these. Um, I'm sure you've been to, to conferences where someone comes up and says, hey, the solution to plastic pollution is this. And you say, no, it's super complicated. It's got to be tailored. depends on what you find. This requires that we, we get data. And what's, what's really inspiring to see is that the data is no longer really just in the hands of a, a handful of scientists. It's really going out to, to the people, to the grassroots movement, putting science in their hands to document what the problem is. And Marina and Michelle, you've done a lot of work to get this, this project off the ground, Trash Blitz, to share it with the global movement to document what is on our, our streets, in our, in our watersheds, on our beach, and use that data to drive local campaigns, very targeted campaigns on specific products, um, and bring it upstream all the way from the oceans all the way to, to the manufacturers of the things that are trashing our, our environment. So I said like two minutes, didn't I? Three minutes? I want to... <laughs> Just end with this beautiful collaboration. This is, this is the boat that we were on, this is how long ago, three years ago? Yeah. This is with uh, the beginning of, of, the, of the SFEI and Five Years collaboration, looking at microplastics on the, on, on the bay surface. This collaboration, again, it's been said this many times, this is where it's at. It's working together upstream, documenting the, the, the pollution problem near shore, in our bays, in our rivers, and taking that and crafting policy, specific policy per item, per polymer, getting good science, and going up to our, our state capital and making it work there. I'm so proud to work with my team. Carolyn, it's been eight years working with you. Um, Anna, happy birthday. It's been a wonderful 10-year ride <laughs> with, with five gyres. And everyone that, that I've had the privilege to sail with, and all of you in this room, it's an inspiring time to be in the movement. So thank you very much.
to let that slip out, did you? Okay. Um, and now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Mark Gold back up to wrap this entire day up and inspire us on how we're going to save the world. <laughs> So this was very well planned until this point. Um, <laughs> because anybody who knows me knows that the last thing you want to do is have me leave, have everybody leave here in an op optimistic fashion. If I do that, that would probably be the first time in my entire career. <laughs> and as Warner started, I'm old. So, um, so today has been an extraordinary day um, and, and it makes sense and, and I'm really glad that, that SFEI and uh, Five Gyres took this approach. It's not every day that you get a study um, and really go to this extent to really share the information with the, the, the advocates um, and the professionals who work in this field on a daily basis um, as well as making sure that it gets coverage in the media um, so that something that could have been a local story or just in a peer-reviewed journal or two, it probably, I'm guessing there's probably at least five articles out of that um, study, um, is, uh, is something that is really there for the entire public um, and really trying to, to make that issue a public issue. Now that being said, um, with the work that has been done that demonstrates the scope and scale of the problem, um, and, under, and basically uh, demonstrated many of the data gaps that we have. We, we, we wish we knew a lot more about um, what the actual environmental impacts are of microplastics, what are the public health ramifications, what are the impacts to aquatic life. Um, those are all really critical issues as well. We've talked about what we can do from a legislative perspective. Um, and. Uh, not me, but Secretary Blumenfeld made it really clear that, um, you know, hopefully January and February, you know, seeing SB 54 and AB 1080 pass would be a really, really good thing um, uh, from the standpoint of really trying to get, uh, turn the tide on this um, growing plastic pollution problem um, and microplastics just being a, a major, major part of it. Um, for me personally, um, who has spent my life in the gutter uh, working on stormwater issues, uh, to, to really see um, how big of a problem urban runoff is in a different way. Um, I just left UCLA where we did about four years of studies, um, a wide variety of different modeling to basically say, oh, what, what happens if we put in X thousand infiltration trenches and biofilters, will that get us to water quality standards attainment? And zinc was the biggest factor. And now here we are talking about tire, um, uh, tires, which are also the biggest source of zinc, um, being the biggest problem from the standpoint of looking at this from a microparticle perspective. Um, so um, a lot of the solutions are the same in stormwater from the standpoint of really taking nature-based solutions looking at things like infiltration uh, trenches and biofilters and the like that we spent a lot of the day talking about. Um, but it also shows you need to maintain them because they're gonna accumulate um, those microparticles over time and those obviously are gonna be a concern as time goes on. Um, so that's something though, uh, you know, having a more universal statewide approach on LID um, really makes a heck, of a heck of a lot of sense for a lot of different reasons. Um, and then you've seen uh, also from the standpoint of that the surprising news that runoff was 300 times uh, larger a source than sewage treatment plants. You know, most of what we've read prior to this study really would have led us to believe that um, the biggest problem was going to be the sewage treatment plants. Um, I think the, the good news, if there is one there, is that we as a state are moving much more towards water recycling. The water recycling standards are generally pretty tough. The level of treatment that one has in water recycling nowadays generally goes well beyond secondary treatment and tertiary treatment. We're looking at advanced treatment um, at most, uh, is mostly the direction that folks are going, especially in Southern California, Orange County being the lead, um, but others, other leaders on that as well, West Basin, et cetera, that have used microfiltration and reverse osmosis, and you don't, you're probably very, very unlikely, it needs to be studied better, but very unlikely to have the same degree of pass-through of microplastics 
um, and discharge to the, to the marine environment when you have that level of treatment. And so that's, that's another potential action, but also another potential um, research area that needs to be looked at. I, I, I love the, the talks on product design um, and really changing how, we're, how we should be go, going about what we're going to um, make, and hopefully that's what SB 54 is going to sort of help us in that and be a lot more than packaging, but really um, start catalyzing the changes that we heard about in textiles. Um, that's really exciting to hear as well. So moving forward, um, also the research questions um, need to be answered from the standpoint of, like I said, um, the harm to, to uh, aquatic life and, and the, um, how well some of the stormwater BMPs are actually doing in removal and how well various different levels of treatment are doing in removal. So sorry to be redundant there, but those are things we can do moving forward. Passing the bill, you guys are the ones that are going to have to make sure that the bills get passed. That's going to be less on my end. Um, you know the legislators who, uh, if not, talk to the, the people who work for the actual authors to find out you know, really where the help is needed with those legislators and giving them greater education on really um, what this, these bills will do in making a difference. Um, and lastly, you know, from our perspective at the Ocean Protection Council, uh, yeah, I, I'm sure we will get inundated with ideas, but bring them on. We, this is not something that any state has really come up with yet. I'm putting together a, ma a microplastic strategy that makes sense that's really going to work. I think you've seen in British Columbia, you've seen um, in the European Union that there's a little bit, excuse me, more of a precautionary principle component to dealing with this issue. To do the usual that we often see um, with uh, regulated contaminants where, you know, the, the body of science that tells us what the impacts are on the impacts to aquatic li life and the impacts to human health, that's going to take a decade to really give us all the complete information that we want. And that's, and that's even if there's a huge investment in that. This is very, very difficult and complex science. And at the same time, you know, we need to move forward in a proactive manner and not wait for perfect science. We know that all of this anthropogenic discharge to, um, to the environment is something that obviously is not going to be great for us. Do we know the scope and scale of the harm? No, we don't. Um, but putting together a strategy that's really going to move the needle um, on reducing the loads to our receiving waters um, is something that really we should all take part of. And I invite you to help us at the Ocean Protection Council really come up with a strategy that makes sense that works for California um, and that we can get going on as soon as possible. So thank you, and there's a lot of work to do moving forward. So I'm the last person standing between you and the bar, so I'll make this extremely short. Thank you very much for everybody showing up today. Um, fundamental rule of life is that uh, information is power. What we've seen in the last six months is almost an explosion of media interest in this issue. I noted today that in the San Francisco Chronicle, there was a story specifically about the opposition that helped kill or, or slow down the passage of uh, SB 54. Uh, the LA Times uh, story this morning on this topic, the title was, The Biggest Likely Source of Microplastics in California Coastal Waters Are Car Tires. It took exactly 52 minutes for the National Car Tire Manufacturer Association to send me an email suggesting a meeting to explain to us their position on, on tires. I, I timed it from the time the story came out. So uh, there is the LA Times story is an excellent uh, story. Um, there will probably be stories tomorrow in the, the San Francisco Chronicle. Um, as a research institute, uh, we find it often frustrating that we get paid to do research but not paid to do the communication to get it out to a li larger audience. The Moore Foundation grant was a godsend in that it provided us with the resources and time to actually do the research, do the publications, have enough money to get publications out and to communicate with a large number of people. So it created this uh, event today, and for that we are eternally grateful. Depending on available future funding, uh, we hope to continue to be a source of data and information to continue to make power 
uh, to make information the source of power and to move the type of change that we want. I'm a grandfather. Uh, the only thing I really care in life is that, that my, when my grandson is my age, he looks back and says, Grandpa Warner did something really good. I think all of you have a kind of a similar goal in life, and I think that the work that you're all doing is, is extraordinary. And to the degree that we can, SFEI will try to continue to, as well as five gyres, will continue to try to provide the data and the information that you need to do what you do best. So with that, let's go drink.